Welcome back. It's Wednesday. It's time for Sharon's Table. And boy, do we have a lot to talk about. But we have also a lot to be proud of. So much black excellence to share with you. I wouldn't rather have anybody else at the table than Brittany Cooper, Amisha Cross, and Candace Kelly. Good morning to you, ladies. Um, we have to start with this. You know, I can't imagine anyone doing this to the three of you um, because there would be a price to pay. Representative Rogers. He told Joyce Beatty to kiss his ass after she asked him to simply put his mask on. Um, Brittany, you first. Role play with me. You want to role play? So you're on the train and um, he approaches you. Yeah. I've, I've been on that train. I was a Capitol Hill intern a couple of decades ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a small state. It makes reasonable sense for her to ask him to put on a mask because, you know, pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and so, look, I not only I probably would have knocked the fire out of him, to be quite honest, like, don't put yeah. your hands on me. Yeah. But, my, but also, I'm like, you can have my entire you know what to kiss if this is what we're doing. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, you know what I'm saying? So I, I think that the challenge for me with this is that we need to be clear that the violence that we're seeing by congressmen uh, mirrors the violence that we saw on January the 6th, that folks were being violent outside of the Capitol while they were doing a kind of legal violence inside the Capitol. But these white men in particular, white men on the right are so angry that they can't even <clears throat> contain their rage anymore. They can't even give it the gloss of civility. So now they're actually assaulting their colleagues, their black women colleagues. And the question becomes, what are we going to do about it as a community? And do we actually understand that when white men feel the freedom to assault black women who are in the Congress, that that tells us about the level of violence and racism that we're actually experiencing and that we're in a different kind of position. And the other thing it says to our communities, again, which is a, a painful point, it doesn't matter how accomplished you are, you can literally be yes, in the halls of Congress and these folks hmm. will still think it's appropriate to put their hands on you. So, Candace, uh, you know, Brittany used words like assault and violence. The words were violent. He put his hands on her. He laid hands on her, okay? That's right. And I don't know what the law is, but I... And, you know, I sometimes feel guilty as your friend because, you know, I'm calling you up. I want to sue everybody <laughs> and file, file charges. And I want to know what what the legal recourse here. And if there is none, tell me there is none. But I need you to take me through it. He laid hands on her and um, not good. Right. It, oh, no, not good at all. Not good for him. So at that point, what I would have done is made sure that I had the proper name first and last, and where he was from for the for the documents, <laughs> so I could file a police report for assault, documents. battery, and yes. disorderly conduct. Yes. Because that's, what, that, that's okay. what you do. You just make sure that it happens. So, But like Brittany said, this is something that is not unexpected. I mean, we've seen it happen outside of the Capitol. We've seen it happen to Black women, to Black men all the time, even today. Sometimes with, it's with a car. Sometimes it's with their voice. Sometimes it's with a poke. And so at the end of the day, this is someone who can be and probably has already been brought up on charges. I'm not sure if that's in the headline, but it's inevitable <laughs> that that would happen. So at that point, when that happens to anyone, even if someone pokes you with a pencil, it doesn't have to be physical body to body. Mm -hmm. Poke me with your pencil. Maybe you even threw a paper airplane at me. That is assault and battery. So you make sure that you have that first and last name spelled properly, Sharon. I wish Representative Clyburn or somebody was on there to help assist in, in a citizen's arrest of this 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 guy. Um, so, Amisha, you know, we're, we're every day it's a new low. It really is each and every day. And I just don't understand when it's going to stop here. And I heard Representative Adam Kinzinger, I think it was yesterday, talking about, mark my words, he's leaving Congress. A civil hmm. war is, is, is where this thing is going to end up. And I wonder what you think about that, because people think it's crazy, but where, where else can it go? No, I, I think that Adam Kinzinger is exactly correct in that, although I'm not going to give him many kudos, because this is a man who sat in Congress and never supported a single piece of civil rights legislation at all. So with, with mm. that being said, he definitely 
not a defender of black people of any of any ilk across this country. But with that being said, I, I think that we, we what we're seeing is this hyper vigilant force among whites, particularly uh, conservative whites, some who were uh, evangelized under Donald Trump, many who already had these sentiments long before Donald Trump ever took his oath of office. I think that we have to understand that the America that we live in today is not that different than the America my grandmother grew up in, in, in Mississippi in the 40s. What we're seeing right now is a white America that wants to take us back, take us back to the Reconstruction era, that wants to eradicate the rights that we have fought so mm -hmm. hard to get across, that wants to eradicate us as having any type of um, any, any type of being in this democracy. They do not believe we deserve to be a part of this democracy, nor that the Constitution protects us in any way. What we're seeing is a hyper level of disrespect, and we've watched it happen over, over the years. I think that now, because the protocols, the identity of Congress is being reshaped because this level of push against African Americans, particularly against Black women, and this isn't the first time, but I think that you know, putting your hands on someone, making ensuring that you are in their space, shows just how much you do not value them, just how much you don't care about them, and honestly, how much you don't believe that they even deserve to be there. That's where we are right now. And yes, I do think that we can lead to something that is quite similar to a civil war right here in America a second time, largely because of the polarizing that has occurred not only within not, not only within the political parties, but also within the race-based rhetoric that we're seeing bubble up across the country. And it's not just in the South. It's happening across the Midwest. It's happening in Northern cities. It's happening in urban centers. This is an us versus them. And the us is really a, something that we have to dig deep on because black people are being othered at a rate that we have not, I would argue that we have not seen mm -hmm. since pre-civil and that's just where we are right now. Yeah, we are. And Brittany, so I wonder why he apologized so quickly. Clearly he didn't mean it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Joe Rogan will get to him. Uh, usually the apology comes first, the discount comes later. But he can't really mean it, and I don't believe there are other stand-up men in his party, or we would know their names by now, who went to him and said, listen, you can't do this to a woman. Why did he apologize so quickly then? You know, he wanted to give the appearance of civility, but here's why we know the apology is, is disingenuous. Because he didn't apologize for putting his hands on her, and he didn't apologize and he didn't acknowledge mm -hmm. that he did it. He doesn't want any mm -hmm. legal recourse for Right. And 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 my thing becomes wow. the Congressional Black Caucus needs to say real clearly that they're not going to accept his apology. They need to listen to the thing that Candace is saying, and he needs to be charged. He needs to be arrested because these mm -hmm. folks love to lock our folks up. Right. Yes. They love to maximize the violence mm -hmm. that our folks do when they're killing us, when we don't have any weapons or any power. And then they love mm. to minimize the violence that they do when they have all of the power. And, and it really becomes a, a matter of a lack of self-control. We do not accept your apology collectively. We, we cannot afford to accept it. And, and the Democratic Party really needs to dramatize that this is also why white folks in the rank and file are becoming more violent mm -hmm. because they're seeing that normalized at the highest mm -hmm. levels of government. And, and the other thing that we need to reject is the idea that Black women then owe civility, that we owe magnanimity, that we have to be generous and accept apologies. Mm -hmm. He meant what he said. And so I think that Representative Beatty, who is, is quite fire and who said, you mess with the wrong one today, needs to keep that same energy and make him <laughs> feel it and make him pay for it. And I think he needs to be censured. I think he needs to be removed. You can't put your hands on a colleague and expect to keep your job. Mm. Not in any place in America can you expect to do it. You can't put your hands on children. If you're a teacher, you can't put your hands. I can't go to Rutgers and put my hands on my colleagues and expect to just roll up. And I have not. ten. <laughs> I have ten. If I touched a colleague, I would lose my job. He needs That's to right. lose his job. He needs mm -hmm. to be removed from community service. It needs to be a full court press. And we don't need to let them get away with this narrative that says it was just a poke in the back. You touched me, and at that point, you won't feel all this fire. Mm. Assault, violent words, violent act. And here's the thing, and we're going to take a quick break, but Representative Hal Rogers, who was asked to simply put a mask on, as they That's say right. so often to unarmed black men, all you had to do was comply. Why didn't you mm. just comply? Uh, so 
That's that's where we'll leave that one. But Joe Rogan is up next because, as I said, first comes the apology that you didn't mean. It's funny how COVID almost got him kicked off misinformation about it, Spotify. But when you just start using the N word left and right, well, that's not that big of a deal. Racism, Rogan, revenue. We'll talk about it. How Spotify is trying to buy us. They want to buy us off <laughs> so they can keep Rogan. <laughs> this is. You, the underbelly of America. What an underachiever. We're right back. <coughs> Welcome back to Sharon's Table on Start Your Day. I'm Misha Cross, Brittany Cooper, Candace Kelly. Um, let's jump right into it. This podcaster is just <laughs> Joe Rogan, <coughs> Spotify. Um, we didn't need more proof here, but Rogan, he does uh, prove to be well, I don't know what else you would call it except racist. You know, these mm. clips on and on and on using the N-word. Social media last week, um, we got a taste of who he really is. Um, but isn't Spotify, mm. Candace, getting rich off of race? Isn't that what it's really? They're all over the place with their, we don't want to censor. Oh, yeah, we'll do this. We'll do that. I mean, they're all over the place. It's about the money. It's about the money. It's about the money that they put up. It's about the money that they don't want to lose. And contrary to popular belief, no matter what they say, they are the employer. They are the mm -hmm. publisher of Joe Rogan because they mm. paid him $100 million. So if Joe Rogan libeled anybody, who do you think that anybody is going to sue? They're going to sue Spotify and they're going to sue Joe Rogan because they knew well in advance going into contracting him for $100 million what those podcasts said. And, and they, they didn't care. Now, what's interesting is what Joe Rogan said. He said, you know what? I feel a sense of relief. Well, I'm sure he does, because now he can finally, on his own terms, come to just say exactly what he wants to say and apologize, without, because he, he, he was caught. That's the bottom line, is that Joe Rogan, when he went rogue, was caught. He didn't acknowledge anything that he did before. He only acknowledged it when they caught him out there. But what's interesting the most about this is Rumble and their response. And here they come. We've got another $100 million for you in order to say what you've been saying. You know, there's so many things that are wrong about this that at the end of the day also boil down to this. If you're an artist on Spotify and if you don't want to support Joe Rogan, too bad. You are. Because people who pay for Spotify are paying for Joe Rogan. He's the mm -hmm. only one that has this big mm -hmm. contract. And, and Spotify needs to take responsibility and acknowledge what they haven't done and do better. That's the bottom line, because they're the ones who are on the line. They hired him. They're publishing him. Well, he apologized, but then the next day he said, it's nothing but a political hit job. He didn't say that when he um, gave that quasi, you know, apology for the COVID misinformation, which is always very interesting, Amisha. But the other thing is, and I'm reading the quote from Rogan, um, an old quote, but still he means it. I'm on Spotify. You can get away with it. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? A hundred million dollars Spotify wants to invest now in, in marginalized groups. You know, he kind of just lumps everybody mm -hmm. together. So what, what now? Should we take the money? Don't take the money? Boycott? What now, Amisha? Spotify has shown its hand. First and foremost, they're raking in money and subscribers hand over fist by, because of Joe Rogan. Um, controversy breeds a lot more access and a lot more opportunity. Joe Rogan not only isn't a, a, apologetic, but on that same token, neither is Spotify. Uh, they have been saying that they want to have more diverse, underrepresented groups actually you know, on the platform. What stopped them from doing that years ago? Spotify has been a name in the game for quite some time. Mm -hmm. The VP of content for Spotify is skin folk. So it's very frustrating that we continue to see this back and forth. And only does this um, does this get elevated in terms of talking about bringing in more diverse voices after the Joe Rogan experience took a took a hit from some of the comments that Joe Rogan made. Mind you, none of these comments were new. This is during the first iteration of his program yeah. on Spotify. The N word had been said hundreds of times over the course of his first few episodes. This is a guy who also pushed misogyny. This is a guy who laughed and cheered on um, uh, guests who talked about how they were coercing women into sexual acts. This is a guy who's, you know, cheered on virtue, various forms of rape. This is not a guy who is helpful, I would say, to our to our general public in terms of not only spreading misinformation, but also someone who's absolutely fine running these campaigns on uh, on racism, on misogyny, on um, you know anti-Semitism. He said a lot of things that should have gotten him, 
removed from Spotify a very long time ago. So part of this argument is that what is what Spotify's responsibility as a host mm -hmm. of someone who is this detrimental? The $100 million man is in the end is going to cost them more than what they're paying him out. But with that being said, they tend to mm -hmm. like the audience that he's modeling. That tells us more about Spotify than anything else. Two positives, two negatives don't make a positive. They're not going to be able to find in the shadows somewhere black people who actually agree with this type of crap who are going to go on and, you know, shuck and jive for them like Fox, mm. Fox News does with the blacks yeah. that they tend to run. And I think that that's more of what they're trying to look for. If it was just underrepresented groups, they could have found black people to be on Spotify a long time ago. There are a ton of black talented podcasters who are starting their own thing and out here still trying to sure. find, uh, you know, Struggling. as prevalent as Spotify happens to be. So I, I don't think that's it. They're trying to cover their tails here. And quite, fr so, quite frankly, it shouldn't work for the black community. So Brittany, in our remaining time, I wonder if you could just, when, why is carnival barking and, and pushing hate speech and rape so profitable? I'm looking at the screen. I see more degrees on this screen. And I just <laughs> don't understand why someone's throwing $100 million at this bald-headed fool who just spews <laughs> goofiness. He's not, there's nothing accurate. There's not scientific. He just spews nonsense and somebody just here, they're shoving the money at him. That's right. Here's the thing that we need to be clear about. This is a closing of ranks around white men to normalize their mediocrity and their right to say whatever they want. That's happening both in the Congress, mm. as we talked about in our previous segment. Wow. It's happening in corporate America. Um, and so this becomes about a corporate gamble that says white mediocrity, white anger, white ableism, white transphobia, mm. uh, you know, racism, all of that is fundamentally more profitable. So this man, uh, the you know, the, the head of Spotify is playing from the playbook of Fox News, of Newsmax, and saying, this is a ready audience that wants to be radicalized mm -hmm. and they will give us their money. Mm -hmm. And so that matters more to us than our diversity initiatives. The thing that we should be thinking about more broadly is that this corporate march away is a bellwether, right? Folks are tired of the 2020 race conversations. There's never much racial, racial stamina among white folks more generally to talk about these issues and to structurally change them for very long anyway. Um, and, and so what they're doing is, is, is setting the terms of, of, around which they can march away. And what they're saying is, we're not gonna be bullied by your diversity initiatives and prerogatives. We have yeah. money and we will pay what we want. That is what is going on. We feel it and we just need to be explicit about it. And when we ask, why are they doing it? Well, it netted them a president. Donald mm. Trump was, a, you know, was has been credibly accused of rape. He certainly bragged on tape about mm -hmm. committing acts of sexual assault. Uh, you know, there's fairly credible rumors that he used the N-word, you know, repeatedly over and over again when he, you know, in the back channels of, of The Apprentice. Uh, so mm. this is the Donald Trump playbook. It has worked. It has procured them power. These folks are on a push to regain power. And when we see a closing of ranks at the level of government, we're seeing it in the courts. We're seeing it in corporations. We need to be on hypervigilance and we need to take our money. We need to back away from these platforms and we need to figure out where our power lies. Uh, and how we're going to weather uh, the storm that is surely coming. Well, we might need to move some people to Alabama, too, because I'm not sure any mm. of our votes would count unless we, mm. we spread them out throughout these other red counties down there. Boy, you just made sense, and you just sent chills up my spine, Brittany, because what you're describing is a very scary corporate push and social contract chicken and egg type thing, which came mm. first. Um, I, I love you, ladies. I enjoy the conversation, and your voices are needed now more than ever. Thanks again. BNC Go is up next. We got a lot to think about.